Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Aram. This is Alex from Team Bayroa, Aram Training. And it's winter time and the question is how do you get better in winter? I mean, how, do you, how can you actually work on your rowing technique in winter? And I've mentioned this in a lot of videos I've done so far. I'm talking about force curves and this is precisely what I'm going to talk about right now. Force curves are basically the essence of how you influence the boat. It's very simple. A force curve is measured, actually the only way you can measure it is in the following way. You have a strain gauge right there on the inboard. And every time you apply a bit of force, there is a, there's an axle right there, a high precision steel axle, and this spins. Now in the boat, the carbon bends and the system is about the same maybe not as precise as here on the Bayer because this thing, this baby has got a 1% accuracy tolerance. So that's, that's actually scientific level. As far as I'm for, standard ergs have around 10%. The other thing is that this Bayer is actually equipped with an angle sensor as well. So we know where you are. And as a matter of fact, uh, this is the only way you can actually measure watts. So it's the force applied by the distance traveled. So we actually calculate all, we count all the degrees. So this is zero. They have one, two, three, four, five, etc. degrees before catch and everything um, before the zero line and after the zero line. So in the end, you end up with a full stroke with an amplitude with all the degrees we add up. So if you add up the degrees you make, so the length of your stroke and the force applied, you get the real watts. So this is why this thing is so precise. The Bluetooth sensors of the Bayerowa actually communicate live with the, with the Bayerowa app. Right now it's only available for Android, it's free in the Google Play Store. Uh, we take about one and a half years minimum to have it available for Apple as well. Alright, so what we do, um, we connected it, now press start to play. There are various screens, I'm, ma I'm mostly going to work with this one, which is the signal screen, but for now, just to guide you through, we have the stroke length in degrees left, the stroke length in degrees right, the power left, the power right. Of course, all the averages. You got, you got your 500 meter split, you get a distance traveled, your stroke rate, you know, all the basic stuff you would expect. Let me get the strokes. This is basically an overview of your session. Um, this mode is quite cool. Maybe, Alex, you can take a short stroke and show what it looks like. You see, okay. You see a, a force by angle curve on the left and on the right, which is different. Can you make another stroke? Then a force and angle curve over a timeline. Now, the mode, the mode I prefer the most to work with as a coach is what I call the life mode. And it's the signals as we get them. Alice, can you do a couple light strokes? All right. You see a bottom value, we see a line here, a red one and a green one. This is your force curve. So every time you apply force, the bending of the oar is measured. And then we have a long curve on the top, that's the position of your hands. Um, Alex, can you stop for a second now? You see the curve is going flat. Can you shoot your hands away? Bob. You see how sharply it drops. Now this basically resembles the harmony of your stroke cycle. So how do I influence the boat by just moving the oar handles? Now a lot of athletes like to stop it to catch a bit because there's too much to do. Not because it's effective, but there's too much work to be done. Alex, can you stop at the catch for a second? You see curve is going flat. Now stop at the finish, curve is going flat again. Can you do a couple of light strokes and make sure uh, you always pause just a fraction at every catch and every finish. You see it's going flat, going flat there, and I don't want that, especially at the catch. I want an immediate uh, recovery at the catch. Can you do this? So no stop at the catch for a second. You see that? It's much better. It's the catch, that's the release. At the release, we still have a bit of a holding pattern, which is good to create stability. In a race, it's never going to be a holding pattern. All right. Thank you. 
You see, we have a red line and a green line. So, like in a bowl, the red line is the right side, the green line is the left side. Now, this entire Foursquare thing, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't view it too religiously, but it's, it helps a good deal to understand how different athletes influence the boat differently. There are people, for example, who have a lot of force at the catch and nothing towards the finish. Alex will try to play that game for us. You see that? I think you can exaggerate even more. Longer towards the finish, less power, just to show the difference. Exactly. You see that there's a difference between the left and the right hand. Again, red is right, green is left. You see that the right, the right hand starts a fraction earlier than the left hand. And of course, picks up much more force than the left hand does. Alright, stop. The reason for this is a classic in rowing. Many athletes actually pull this way, so because you want to have your right hand closer to the body, the left hand farther away, a lot of athletes make that mistake that at the catch, they pull with the right hand time-wise ahead of the left hand, just to make sure that the right hand comes closer, to, they don't hurt their hands. Now, what this does to the boat is something that's highly inefficient because, first of all, you have an asymmetric load on your body, on the entire system and then your stern slightly swivels. And I see this with almost every rower. Non-rowers on a bi-rower don't have that problem because they're not used to row asymmetrically. We think we row symmetrically in sculling, that's not true. Sometimes we even see um, you know, muscle deficiencies and things like this. We use the bi -row quite a lot, also in other sports, to work on symmetry, like in tennis, where you have one side that's much more dominant than the other one, or ice hockey. So this, this by row is not just used for rowing only. But in rowing we also see that especially scholars try to do this like right hand then the left hand. At the finish usually you see the left hand over pulling the right. So this is where we try to counter steer. So every stroke we have a bit like whoa a wobble in there. This is not effective especially during a race. All right. So as you do this on a bi rower, on a bi rower, what happens, you actually take away force. So if Alex starts with the right hand ahead of the left one, he takes away all the force from the left side. You never feel it that, that strongly in the boat, but on the bi rower, you feel it immediately. So a lot of people think the bi rower is broken. No, it's not. It's your technique, but nobody likes to hear that. The bi rower makes you feel certain things better than the boat does. All right. Now let's try it again and try to get it synchronized. Ah, uh, you see, that's getting a lot better, a lot better now, and this is what we call the play mode, so athletes really learn to play and learn to influence the boat in a much more efficient way, and because Alex now sees the force curves in front of him, he can start to adapt and also feels it. All right, now what we try to do now is a backloaded drive, so a backloaded drive means that you take a long time to pick up force and have all the, you know, the most of the bulk of the force towards the end of the stroke. All right, Alex, it's gonna be a challenge. So easy catch, hard towards the finish. Easy, easy, ooh -ba. That's a classic backloader drive. All right, stop. You see that little wobble here? That's a double force buildup. So you see the curve goes up a bit, whoop, he loses it, comes back again. Now, this is nothing but catching too hard with the legs at once, kicking too hard, the body cannot transfer everything. So, to make you understand what's happening, can you go to the catch real quick? All right. If you kick too hard with the legs right there, um, your shoulders are not able to, to transfer all the force the legs actually can apply. So, what the body does, it reduces the force from the legs automatically, there's nothing you can do and starts to pick up force once more. The smoother the catch curve becomes, um, the smoother you are, the, you are in the boat as well. All right, good. Now, we saw, we saw the back-loaded drive. Now, the next thing you're gonna do is a front-loaded drive, just to show the opposite. Alex is now gonna play around with a front-loaded and a back-loaded drive to show you the difference. 
Because if we have people in the boat, if you're a coach and you have athletes in the boat who row a front-loaded drive, you can be fast. If you row a back-loaded drive, you can be fast. There's also a third stuff I'm going to talk about. But these guys never going to make a fast team boat together. And that's the big problem we see with many, many, many teams and team selections. Most team selections are based on on, on ERG values, on ERG scores. They don't tell you anything about how uh, an athlete influences the boat. And another factor is that an ERG has actually nothing to do with rowing because the motion is linear. And a linear motion affects the shoulders and the back differently than the real boat. We all know that. Yet still, we, s- we keep on selecting just people for boats based on a wrong motion, on a, on a linear ERG, and based on earth scores only. Now, good luck trying to synchronize a front-loaded and a back-loaded um, drive athlete. All right, Ali's gonna play that for us. Now, that's a classic back-loaded drive. Long pickup, everything towards the finish. Now, Alex is changing the game, you see that? A lot of pickup at the catch. Jup. Versuch richtig hart die Auslage vorn und dann gar nichts mehr zu machen. That's a classic front-loaded drive. No? Das ist schon der dritte Stil, den suche ich jetzt nicht. Schau wirklich vorne, einmal kurz hart und dann locker ausschwimmen lassen. That's a classic front-loaded drive. These people usually have way too much force and cannot sustain the pace throughout the rest of the stroke. Now, okay, the th- what I'm looking for in the boat is a plateau over the middle. Now, the most effective face for your stroke is this one right there. Why? Because the blade is in a 90 degree angle towards the bow and everything you do here accelerates the boat almost immediately. See at the catch that blade is actually pointing away from the boat. It's not too effective. This is why it's not effective to kick in with the legs very hard because you actually you know you evaporate power. You don't do anything with it. You gotta, you gotta make sure that you turn power into motion and therefore the blade needs to be in a good angle. Now the idea is to be careful. Um, I had a very good analogy uh, recently. The first couple of centimeters of every stroke is just motion, not power. Very smart. Because this way you get the boat into motion, you connect with the water, you connect with the boat, and then you really try to accelerate the boat throughout the middle of the drive. Now I want to have a force plateau, which means the force curve is going flat on the top, just for a short, period of time, that's about enough. It's never going to be the rectangle. This is what I'm looking for theoretically, but forget it, it's not going to work. All right, so my goal is to make my athletes have a plateau around the middle face of the stroke. If I get every athlete on my team to understand this in the winter when nobody else is able to roll, I have a perfectly synchronized team when I get back on the water in spring. And this is precisely the the reason why we started with by rower um, 18 years ago. It's, it's 2018 right now. We started in 2000, 2001. Um, I had three to four jobs to pay for that company. My partner invested his entire retirement. This is a passion project and you see how it pays off. All right, now, you see now, he's gradually getting into the game. So he's now trying to, he's now trying to extend this plateau a bit, you know, get longer, make a bit more of a plateau right there. This was a good one. Yeah, yeah, you see the catch is becoming smoother now. Very nice. That was a nice one. And what Alex is doing right now, he's playing around. That playing around is precisely what you're supposed to do. I give my athletes a challenge and they find out how to use their body in a unique way. Very nice catch. Very nice, very effective. You see a very long stroke, 109 to 109 degrees, a little bit of difference in the watts because his right hand still picks up force too early, he comes from the boat. That's a roughly 200 watt power output, both sides combined. Looks good. What I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna store this session I'm going to look at the signals and I'm going to go to the 5 second resolution and trying to go back a bit. 
what we see is a bit of a, a, a pausing pattern towards the finish. This is just the way Alex rode in his quad this year. And, uh, but a nice return at the catch. So there's not a lot of pause on the oar handles at the catch. So actually this is what I'm looking for. If we check the summary, we do see a bit of difference. We have a 73 to 99 watt uh, ratio. So that's a, com a combined power output of 172 and 40.7 to 59.3 percent in power balance. So it's not because Alex is weak on one side, it's because he takes away the force on one side. But that's a matter of synchronicity and it's a matter of training. Uh, the Spyro is not meant to be a testing tool, but to be a training tool. All right, the session was six minutes long, roughly one and a half K, um, no heart rate monitor connected, a pace of 211, a speed of 3.8 meters per second, stroke rate 23, stroke length, um, a combo of 103 degrees, um, so that's actually quite good, 102 on the left, 103 on the right, um, that's the complete average, probably towards the end of the session it was a lot better. Good. Now the interesting thing now is, um, this is what many people ask me, what are the watts compared to a classic ERG? Now in a classic ERG, and I'm intentionally not calling any names, there are no strain gauges and there are no angle sensors. So the watts you get are based on an algorithm. It's not measured performance. So this is why you can cheat so well. And as far as I'm informed, some feds are actually going away from them. From them. Now, the way we calculate watts here are actually based on stroke length, distance traveled and force applied. So therefore you can never cheat. Uh, if you use a classic ERG, you can pick up the stroke rate, your watts will go up. Here, you have to stay long. If you become too short, your watts gonna drop because you don't travel enough dif distance with your oar. All right, now, the thing is that you need to spend time adapting your stroke. And this is precisely what the Biro is meant to be. Um, and this is, what I, this is what I use for my coaching. And all of the insights I have when I look at you know, videos and then you ask, how can you see that? I spend so much time watching rowers and seeing force curves on the by rower with a real boat setup that by now I can see a boat and I can guess the force curves pretty accurately. And this is what my athletes now can do too. It's about understanding how athletes influence the boat and this is what you can see here also you know, with the signal mode, with the balance mode, see the difference in, in, in shapes and everything. All right, guys, I hope this video made it clear somehow how to become more efficient in the winter, how to become faster in the spring, how to make faster keen boats. Thank you, Alex. And if you have not already subscribed to the channel, now is a good time to do so. I've just crossed the 4K mark. I would love to see the 10K um, anytime soon. So spread the word. I know a lot of you guys are watching the videos not being subscribed. Subscribe please. It just gives me a thumbs up. All right. Have a good day and I'm looking forward to see you soon. Bye-bye.